from Quito, Ecuador. My name is Carla Gonzalez. This is From the South, the evening news brief on Telesur English. We start this new edition right now. We begin in Peru, where Congress is debating a move to impeach President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski over his alleged links with the Brazilian construction company Odebrecht. In the morning, the president was summoned to the Congress by the majority led by Keiko Fujimori, which is leading the move to impeach him. Kuczynski told the lawmakers he had no personal or professional links to Odebrecht. It was his company Westfield that had those links and that he never knew about them. He said he regretted not informing the Lava Jato Commission about the conflict of interest, but repeated that a vote to remove him would amount to a coup. I just hope that Parliament understands the extreme magnitude of the mistake that it is committing and does not vote in favor of vacating without real motivation. The damage they do will not be to me. They will do it to Peru. Members of Congress, I know you love your country. Act accordingly. Whether to save democracy or to sink it for a long time is in your hands. Protesters filled the streets of Lima on Wednesday night to denounce corruption and demand a clean government. Many of them said President Kuczynski should be removed, but they also expressed no confidence in the right-wing majority in Congress who are leading the impeachment process. They say the supporters of Keiko Fujimori are also corrupt and that all of them should go. People, I think, are completely angry and with good cause over the recent corrupt acts by the president, members of parliament and regional presidents. What's happening with the current president, PPK, and ultimately with his removal, because it seems that's where we are heading and it seems to us right, is that we need to change the rules of the game. This democracy has been promoting corruption for years. We want our country to be a country of laws, because all our governments have sold us out. They have no idea what national sovereignty is, and they have no interest in the actual people. Those dreadful pro-Fujimori members of Congress are not interested in the actual people. They are only interested in continuing to enrich themselves with the money they get from the people of Peru. With almost all the results in from Catalonia's regional elections, pro-independence parties appear to have won a narrow major majority. As the vote count came to a close, the pro-unionist Ciudadanos party had the largest number of seats, 36, while the three main national nationalist parties together had 70, two more than they needed to retain their absolute majority. The Spanish ruling party of Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy was heading for a humiliating defeat looking likely to lose more than half of its seats in the Catalan parliament. As pro-independence supporters waited anxiously for the results, it seemed that the party of the dismissed Catalan president, Carles Puigdemont, would come out as the largest nationalist force, with a projected 34 seats just behind Ciudadanos. Earlier, it seemed as though the more left-wing ERC party would overtake Puigdemont's Junts per Catalunya, if the results are confirmed, it is still far from clear that the divisions in Catalonia will be overcome. I've always felt Catalan. I've never felt Spanish. Catalans have always felt attacked by the Spanish state, at least me. Our culture, our language, our financing, and a bit because of that. I mean, I don't have anything against the Spanish citizens, but against a state that is always repressing us. I think everything is very balanced. And me being Spanish from Andalusia, I would like us to continue as we are. I don't know if it's the best option. My children think completely different from me because they are Catalan. While voting was still underway, our correspondent Vincent Montagut sent this report from Barcelona. 
During this interesting voting day, one of the most relevant facts we have confirmed so far is the turnout on this election day. Until now, 34.69% of the voters have gone to a voting center, only four tenths less than the elections held in 2015. It's important to remember that the last elections were held on a Sunday, a rest day, but today people had to adjust their visit to the polling station to the work schedule. This exceptional election was called by the central government of Mariano Rajoy, now by the autonomous government, as is usually. Three candidates are in prison, among them Oriol Junqueras, the leader of the Esquerra Republicana of Catalonia, that's up in the polls to win these elections. But it is also neck and neck with the sacked Catalonia president Carles Puigdemont, that is in exile in Brussels, capital of Belgium. For many civilians, this election is the referendum that couldn't be held on October 1st, with all the democratic guarantees. They have also said the results of today's voting process will have big consequences, not only in Catalonia but in Spain, and for the government of Mariano Rajoy after his decision of putting into effect Article 155 of the country's constitution, and that allowed the dismissal of the government of Catalonia. That was Vincent Montagut from Barcelona. The presidents of Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay and Uruguay, and also Bolivia, have been meeting in Brasilia at the Mercosur meeting. The meeting focused on economic integration and a planned free trade agreement with the European Union. Bolivia is in the process of becoming a full member of Mercosur, and Guyana, Suriname and several other countries attended as observers. There was some disagreement over free trade and the possibility of a deal with the EU. The European Union is a natural destination for our exports. It will enable us not only to boost trade, but to attract investment, technology and create many business opportunities. In spite of our efforts and the commitment of the majority of European countries, the Mercosur-EU agreement has still not been achieved. Unfortunately, unfortunately for us, for Uruguay, a lot of progress has been made in negotiations which are not easy, because that is not the kind of agreement we are seeking. But there is still a long way to go, and those remaining issues are substantial ones, including rules of origin, public procurement, and no more nor less than market access. For more on this, we have our correspondent Adriana Robreño, who sent this report from Brasilia. We are at the Foreign Ministry Building, where the 51st Mercosur Summit is taking place. Earlier this morning, Brazil's President Michael Temer received his counterparts from Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Bolivia, this last country going through the process of becoming part of this bloc, as well as representatives from Chile, Peru, Suriname, Guyana, Colombia, which are observer states to Mercosur. During this opening session, President Michael Temer talked about the last six months in which his country has led the bloc. He said that Mercosur is entering a new phase as its members try to complete an agreement with the European Union this coming year. During these last six months, Mercosur's agenda has revolved around the economic issues and possible free trade agreements, although this con contradicted the views of Bolivia's President Evo Morales, who said this morning that the free trade agreements only provoked dependence and poverty. Morales also criticized the fact that Mercosur suspended Venezuela from the regional bloc in August. He said that Venezuela right now needs help to become part of the region. Morales also asked Temer to support the dialogue between Venezuela's government and the opposition. The Mercosur summit is taking place in Brasilia, and the presidency of the bloc will now be passed to Paraguay until June of 2018. Representatives of this country have said they are going to continue the work on the commercial relations between the four countries that conform this bloc and promote commercial agreements with other countries like Canada, South Korea, and Singapore, which are already being negotiated. That was Adriana Robreño from Brasilia. And we'll be back very soon. Stay with us.
Cuba's National Assembly of Popular Power has voted to extend its current session by two months to April. This decision means that President Raul Castro will also step down two months later than planned. The Assembly said that the delay will allow more time to deal with the damage done to Cuba's infrastructure and economy by Hurricane Irma. The Economy Minister, Ricardo Cabrizas, told the Assembly that in spite of the hurricane and President Trump's tightening of the U.S. blockade, the Cuban economy has grown by 1.6% in 2017. The Opposition Alliance Against Dictatorship in Honduras has called on the armed forces not to obey orders from the government of Juan Orlando Hernández. More than 30 people have been killed since the protests began against fraud in the elections on November the 26th. More details in the next report from our correspondent, Hilda Silvestrucci. They held crosses as a sign of pain and mourning, with the names of the victims killed since the 2nd of December. We want justice for all these people who died from the bullets of these repressive armed forces, from this repressive government. We don't have any more patience. Look at the deaths. The protest reached the headquarters of the High Command of the Armed Forces, which was guarded by a strong military and police deployment. The Alliance leaders made an appeal to military authorities. Why do you repress and murder those who peacefully claim their rights? None of us here have any weapons other than our ideas and our rights. According to the Human Rights Defenders' statistics, around 60% of deaths were youth under the age of 25 and from low-income communities. They will remain in Honduran history because they stepped up to defend the rights of over 8 million Hondurans. It is clear that an 80% of the people don't want a dictator for president. At first, the deaths happened at night, when a curfew was decreed. Protests were organized in the poor neighborhoods. The military arrived and shot people. We are really asking the international community to take a look at our country, because this fight won't stop. People are outraged. We will fight and defend it with our lives. In spite of the deaths, protesters remain in the streets of the main cities waiting for the government of Juan Orlando Hernández to agree to correct the irregularities in the electoral process. The initial three-day program of protests ended here. They continue this Thursday outside the United States Embassy, and on Friday they have called for a national strike. Venezuela's foreign minister, Jorge Arreaza, continues his visit to China to strengthen economic and political ties. Arreaza took part in a ceremony in Beijing to unveil a plaque with a message from the late leader of the Bolivarian Revolution, Hugo Chavez. They then released a flock of doves of peace into the air. Arreaza also met with the head of the International Liaison Department of the Communist Party of China, Song Tao. Now we go to Paraguay, where indigenous Guarani people are camping in squares near the Congress. They were evicted from their lands by big farmers and are demanding their right to return from the state. Let's take a look at it in the next report. MBYA Guarani indigenous people are camping out in the center of Asuncion. They were stripped of their lands in the Canin de U province, 340 kilometers from the Paraguayan capital. They say that public prosecutors ordered the burning of 18 homes to favor Brazilian agribusinesses. They burnt all of our houses. That really affected us. And now we're on the streets to demand that the Paraguayan state and the indigenous institute legalize our lands because we have nowhere else to go. Our home has always been there. An investigation by the Ranch Watch Observatory revealed that 14% of Paraguay's properties are already in the hands of Brazilian agribusinessmen. The Guarani indigenous people say they need to recover the lands just to survive. The foreign age came. We know that they are the ones who control land in Paraguay. We need our lands back. They belong to us, and we ask people to support us. The rights of the indigenous people are written into Paraguay's constitution, but in recent years, many of them have been stripped of their lands by the growth of agribusinesses. They say that the state doesn't protect them enough. 
They want to take away all of our territories. But there's the law, the national constitution, in its fifth chapter in Article 62 to 67. It says how we, the indigenous communities of Paraguay, have rights over our territories. Over 100,000 indigenous people live in Paraguay, distributed among 17 ethnic groups. According to the official numbers, 8 out of 10 of them live in extreme poverty. They say the government of Horacio Cartes hasn't offered any kind of solution to their problems. The Supreme Electoral Tribunal of Bolivia has sworn in 26 judges who were elected on, the, on December 3rd. The new public servants will be in charge of the Agro-Environmental Tribunal, the Judiciary Council, the Supreme Justice Tribunal and the Constitutional Tribunal. During the ceremony, the new judges made a commitment to fight corruption and strengthen the justice system. The president of the Supreme Electoral Tribunal said the event reinforced democracy in Bolivia. We are very grateful about the turnout we had during the elections on December 3rd. 84% of the population voted to choose those who will lead the judicial branches and the constitutional tribunal. Earlier this year, we brought you a series of reports from the Mapuche indigenous lands of southern Chile, an area seldom visited by journalists. To mark the end of 2017, we're giving you another chance to see these exclusive stories. Here's the second in the series by Telesur's Paola Dragnich and Juan Pablo Aranela. To the naked eye, this green landscape can be misleading. It looks like a natural forest, but it isn't. These are thousands of hectares of industrial plantations of pine and eucalyptus, genetically controlled and harvested systematically, mainly to produce cellulose. The ecosystem is no more. Natural water sources, life itself, cannot develop in this arid and acid soil. Before, there were Mapuche communities living here. The communities always lived around these hills. These hills were their point of reference. In the traditional vision we have between man and nature and everything this relationship provides. From balance and biodiversity to Lutrophilmonian, Machokimu and everything we Mapuche know as the forms of life and the conception of man and the world. The Mapuche's demand to recover the land is not a whim. There are still some protected spaces that survive as a result of their resistance. Areas where the water, the hills, and the ancient Araucaria trees express this Mapuche philosophy, in which the identity and territory cannot be separated. We are Mapuche, people from the land, people who are in direct connection with the territory. That's why it's our responsibility to recover our land, so this territory can live again. The government of Salvador Allende promoted a reform to give them back their lands. But during the Pinochet dictatorship and the democratic governments that followed, the Mapuche were left with crumbs and their lands were given away to companies. Our territory has been devastated by capitalism and multinational companies because the Chilean state has given these lands to foreign people for them to fill their pockets with money, while our people are still living in poverty, squeezed into tiny communities. That's why we, as Mapuche youth, have the responsibility to take up this fight again. The logging companies dominate over 3 million hectares, today owned by Winca families, as they call the white settlers in the Mapudungun language. All this thanks to the millions of dollars in subsidies from the Chilean state and to the police who protect these businesses repressing the Mapuches' attempts to recover their land, resources and autonomy. The Mapuche also reject their assistentialism of what they call forced inclusion by the state. These communities live basically from agriculture, animal husbandry, and also what we call productive reappropriation. The state calls this a crime. They say we are stealing wood. We say we are taking back the raw material located on the land that was stolen from us. And, according to them, they're willing to recover whatever they can, however they can. The biggest archipelago of the four surrounding Cuba was practically destroyed after Hurricane Irma. Three months after, we visited the location in the north coast of the island 
and which is one of the most important touristic spots in the Caribbean. The stone path turning into an improvised highway overlooking the sea is a testament to what visitors can expect. This road was destroyed by Hurricane Irma, the strongest ever registered in the Atlantic Ocean, although it leads to the amazing natural beauty of Coco Key. Here we found an Italian fishing guide waiting for the sunset. I've been fishing at Marina Gaviota all day. I had a great time. This place is great for fishing. It's been 14 years since I've been to Cuba. And what do you think of its recovery? Great and very fast. The road is really good and the bridges are also recovered. Visitors are surprised when they see hotels that have lost their roofs and gardens. We were the first ones to come back after the hurricane. We were surprised to see the extent of the damage. The hotel was destroyed and we didn't think that we were going to recover this fast. It's been a huge accomplishment. We couldn't believe it. We did all this work in around two months, fast and effective. I think visitors are the biggest witnesses of what we did. Not us who saw those images that were published around the world. Visitors wouldn't believe if they would have seen it before. The head of the kitchen was among the 10 people that stayed in the hotel when Hurricane Irma hit. He said he felt scared, but he knew his duty was to take care of the property. Now he feels proud for the job everyone's made. Sol Cayo Coco Hotel was the first one to open its doors, just a month and a half after Irma. Visitors have to keep on coming, without fear, as many regular clients have returned. Everything is ready to receive them with a big desire to work. We haven't lost that charisma that tourists like so much. Sol Cayo Coco Hotel maintains that Cuban identity, beautiful beaches and a safe place to vacation. Cuba is the safest tourism destination in the world. Nights at Cayo Coco are unforgettable. Felix, that left the island in 1993, can visit without having moments like this. I am surprised because I never thought they could rebuild everything in such short time. Everything is great. Hotels prepare for the peak vacation season as new visitors arrive. Just as Cuban authorities said, tourism is fully moving and most services are working for the high season. Fabiola López, Telesur, Cayo Coco, Cuba. Panamanians commemorated on Wednesday the 28th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of their country. Thousands of people were killed in the military operation and the protesters wanted to be a day of national mourning. Members of different social movements marched to commemorate another year of the U.S. aggression against the country. They don't want people to forget. We remember today that 20 years have passed since the U.S. invasion, a cruel day which we want to be recognized as a day of mourning. We want the U.S. to admit that they led a criminal invasion and to apologize to the Panamanian people for their actions. On December the 20th, 1989, the U.S. armed forces began what they called Operation Just Cause. It was supposed to remove General Manuel Noriega from power. These people say it was another example of how the United States interferes in Latin America. Even after a commission was set up in 2014 to investigate the events, not all the victims of the invasion have been identified, and people don't believe they will ever get justice. 5,000 dead people do not mean anything to the oligarchy in this country, nor to political parties like Pro, Cambio Democratico, the Anolfist movement, and others who have been ruling this country for 27 years. And because this means nothing to them, the dead haven't been identified, no tribute has been paid to them, and this day hasn't even been declared as a national day of mourning. There is still a North American presence in Panama, and the invasion was just the beginning of a series of pro-imperialist governments. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us.
Now let's take a look at our war news roundup. A Australian man of Afghan descent with a history of mental health issues drove a car into Christmas shoppers in the city of Melbourne, injuring 19 people. But police say they do not believe the attack was terror related. What we do know about the driver of the car, uh, he is a 32 year old Australian citizen of Afghan descent. He is a person who is known to Victoria Police. He has historical assault matters. Um, he is not currently on any bail or any uh, corrections order or anything of the like and has a history of drug use as well as mental health issues. We understand, as I said, this still is very early days, that he is on a mental health plan and receiving treatment for a mental illness. We are working through those to clarify that. He is still in custody under arrest for these offences for what we allege is a deliberate act. President of United States Donald Trump has threatened to cut off financial aid to countries that back a United Nations resolution opposing the recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. His remarks come ahead of a UN General Assembly vote on a resolution opposing any recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Trump also hailed the tax reform bill as a victory for his administration. These are the people right behind me. They've worked so long, so hard. It's been uh, an amazing experience, I have to tell you. Hasn't been done in 34 years, but actually really hasn't been done because we broke every record. It's the largest, I always say the most massive, but it's the largest tax cut in the history of our country and reform, but tax cut. Really something special. Cyril Ramaphosa, the newly elected president of South Africa's governing party, the African National Congress, has vowed to fight corruption. Ramaphosa made the pledge while closing the party's conference. He also promised to pursue a policy of, quote, radical economic transformation and to tackle unemployment. Ugandan lawmakers voted overwhelmingly on Wednesday to remove presidential age limits. This paves the way for President Yuwari Museveni to serve a sixth term in office. The highly controversial bill passed with 315 votes for, 62 against and two abstentions after three days of chaotic debates in which some opposition MPs were suspended while others walked out. Residents of Bogota and tourists alike are in awe due to an illuminated Christmas train that passes through the Colombian capital. The train is over 1,300 feet long and comprises of 14 train cars, where a Santa Claus can be expected to pass through them as the train is in transit. It can carry 600 tourists at a time, and around a quarter are usually foreigners, who are all excited to take part. And we've come to the, the end of this uh, evening news brief. This and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.